All right, hello everyone and welcome to the second CGNA uh, session on toward better visual analysis. Hang on one sec. Okay, good. <laughs> um, the first paper in this session is evaluating the readability of force directed graph layouts, a deep learning approach, and it will be presented by Hamad Halim. Welcome to our presentation on our paper, Evaluating the Readability of Graph Layouts, a Deep Learning Approach. We will start by motivating our research question and then presenting our research question that we tried to answer. We will then discuss the background of our work, specifically how we generated the training data set for our model. I will then pass the time to my co-author Hamad, who will talk about the CNN model design and evaluation followed by the conclusion of our presentation. To start the motivation, we have to ask the question, how do we know if a graph is correctly drawn? In this example, you can see the exact same underlying data drawn in four different ways, each way minimizing and maximizing various graph properties. And so we ask the question, what is a good graph drawing? Well, it is a drawing that conveys the correct information well, that is relevant to the particular use case. The and the next natural question is, well, what aesthetic properties do we want to preserve in our layout so that we get a good graph drawing? And again, this is going to depend on the actual use case. And it's based on that use case we can decide which properties we want to preserve and which properties we do not particularly care about. And so from this loose definition of aesthetic properties, we can make it more quantitative by talking about metrics themselves, specifically readability metrics of a graph. And the readability of a graph drawing often refers to how well a graph drawing conforms to a desired aesthetic criteria or conforms to a particular range of readability metric values as the readability metrics can then be used to quantify a goodness of graph layout. Traditionally, many such metrics have been proposed, such as node overlap, edge crossings, and group overlaps. And depending on the use case, you will select which one of these you want to optimize the graph drawing for. However, computing these metrics can be a difficult process and can require a lot of computational power scaling polynomially with the input graph size. Here is an example of the same graph, but focusing on various different graph metrics when it's being created, resulting in these different visual re re representations of the graph. Now, there are some drawbacks of the traditional methods. For one, you always need the node and edge coordinates of the underlying graph to compute these metrics, requiring you to store all of that information, which can result in a large memory or storage overhead. Furthermore, to calculate all of those readability metrics, the complexity of them will be proportional to the size of the graphs themselves. At the very least, the, these metrics can be approximately E squared in co co complexity with E being the number of edges. And for other metrics, this can be a much larger asymptotic complexity, which can result in a long time to compute these metrics for every graph drawing that you have. And so we want to ask this research question. Could we evaluate the readability of a graph layout by directly using the layout images themselves? To do this, we would have to train a model that would learn to look at the image representation and predict the value of the metrics. To train this model, we first need some training data, and we decided to create our benchmark data set in a three-step process. We would first generate the, net, the networks using the parameterized inputs, then use our force directed algorithm to then draw, enhance, and extract these layout images. And finally, we'd label and store these images using traditional storage methods. In our work, we focused on labeling our, our networks with these 10 metrics. When creating the benchmark data, 
we had synthetic data, which followed the process mentioned before, out of which we were able to get 16,500 networks. And we also had some real data, which we got by downloading real large networks and doing a random walk on them to sample them. These walks were bounded by the same parameters as our synthetic data to ensure that they would not deviate too much from the original data set. From here, we were able to get 5,000 networks. To talk a little bit about our graph drawing, our graph drawing algorithm would take the underlying network structure and generate a particular graph layout. The model that we used allowed us to parameterize the gravity with three different values and charge for three different values, allowing us to create nine different layouts based on the different pairings of gravity and charge for any single underlying net network structure. Here are some sample images already labeled that we were able to generate with our model. I will now pass on the time to my co-author, Hamad. In this section, we discuss about CNN model design and evaluation. We use a convolutional neural network model architecture for this problem. Six convolutional layers followed by two fully connected layers are being used. The input to the model is a four channel RGB image with red, blue, green, and depth being the parameters. Max pooling is used between each of these layers with a kernel size of three cross three. A quadratic loss function and re ReLU activation function is used. First two layers learn about simple features while the remaining will learn about more evolved or complex features. Kernel size of three cross three is chosen because we can capture all image features using that size. In the final layer, we replace this softmax with output neurons. Softmax is used in VGGNet for classification problems, and we are solving a regression problem. Model is highly influenced by VGGNet. Uh, we reduce the total number of layers and filters. Using the above architecture, we train three models for th three different groups of metrics. Node feature learning model, with four outputs, edge feature learning model with three outputs, and global metric learning model with three outputs. To evaluate, evaluate how good the model is performing, we did two tests. Evaluation against synthetic data. We take the synthetic data, partition it into three parts. We choose two for training and one for testing, and then we rotate. On the right-hand side, you can see the percentage errors from these tests. As you can see, simple metrics like number of nodes, uh, number of clusters, the model is performing quite well and give good results for other metrics as well. To further improve the results, we mix this synthetic data with real data set. We compute PE2, which is the percentage error when the model is trained with both synthetic and real data. The abnormalities in real data help the model to better learn about graphs that are not structured. As we can see, some of the more evolved or complex metrics uh, have higher accuracy or lower errors especially the node overlap and group overlap shows significant performance benefits. In the next step, we try to visualize different convolution net network layers. We pass a single image through the convolution network and try to see how the different filters are reacting. As we can see, the first few layers ha have features which are understandable by humans, while the final layers have more hidden or latent features that get blurry. We take a closer look at the first two layers. First two layers uh, learn about basic shapes, edge and node boundaries, structural properties, and groups. We identified five different filters. We can see filter A learns about node structures or nodes. Filter B learns about the edge structure, or you can say it's an edge detection filter. Filter C learns about group structure and D learns about edge boundaries and graph structure. E learns about the graph structure. In the next step, what we did was we convert the outputs of the convolution layers to a vector of 4096, and then we pass it through a TSNE embedding model, which, gen which generates a two-dimensional output. We plot this output, and while doing so, we observe that similar images or similar graphs are clubbed together, whereas non-similar images are, are far away. This gives a support to, that, to the fact that the convolution layers are able to preserve graph properties and are learning. 
In the next step, we will talk about the application scenarios of our approach. There are multiple interactivity-based application scenarios, which can significantly benefit from our technique. As the output predictions of the model are quite fast, a real-time metric-based summarization of visualization can be done quite quickly in an AR, VR setup. This can further be used by search engines to build image searches of complex visualizations. Furthermore, uh, a metric-assisted drawing for streaming graphs and metric computation for interactive graph drawing can be done in a real-time manner and can assist greatly with streaming graph drawings. We list a few limitations of our model. Our model is limited by the training data set. If the training data set is good enough, then we can pro provide with better results. We need a larger, well-established data set and more research is required to construct such a database Model performs bad with edge metrics. This can be improved with specific network design for the purpose. Hairball images and very dense graphs were removed as they were decreasing the model performance. Model has a, a large amount of time cost as it takes quite long to train the model, but training is only used once and prediction can be quite fast once the model is trained. Training times increases for larger images. So as a result of memory, we have a limit on number of nodes and the image size. Method also fails for very large graphs as we are limited by the size of the image. To conclude, we presented a novel deep learning based approach to evaluate the readability of graph layouts by directly using graph images. We present qualitative and quantitative re results. We ran k-fold analysis on the result to compute errors, we visualize the convolution layers and the fully connected layers. We discuss potential application scenarios that provide support for the usefulness of our approach. Thank you. All right, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, as we wait for questions to come in on Discord or YouTube, I'll ask one of my own. Um, I'm curious what you would be specifically looking for in a training database. What kind of variety of graphs would you want to include there and why? So uh, our data set only included uh, synthetic graphs to begin with. And like, so when I say synthetic graphs, we actually created graphs using JavaScript and we created a big database of those graphs. Uh, in the second step, what we did was we extracted some images Hello, from everyone. research I'm papers seeing. in our, in our lab in and then no mix them together. Today. The ideal database here would be a set of images that are pre-labeled and extracted from like uh, research papers or online articles. So they, they, have, they would have a lot of noise to, basically because of image quality, as well as the type of images people are looking at. Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. And uh, Christian asks, could you tell us some more about application scenarios? So when this was being done, um, we had a good application scenario in our mind where we were working on another project in parallel where we wanted to be able to predict what would be the next node in a streaming graph. So if you, if you can learn, um, if you have a streaming graph and if you can learn what is, what node or not, what edge is going to come next, you can redraw it. And that's very useful when you're, when you're trying to draw like streaming graphs. So that was the main usage, except apart from that, I think it can be very useful for search in the, in, engines, especially like the ones which, which are maybe trying to index um, visualizations. So uh, these were the two major use. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Hamad. Um, appreciate the talk. And I think it's time to move on to the second talk in our session. So the next talk will be flow field reduction by reconstructing vector data from 3D streamlines using deep learning. And presenting will be Jun Han.
Hello everyone, I'm Jin, a first year PhD student at the University of Notre Dame. Today I will introduce a data reduction pipeline for static fact field data using deep learning techniques. So first one is what is a fact field? Fact, a fact field is a mapping that assigns a factor V to each point P in the domain U. The flow within the space can be represented by factors. A factor Vx, Vy, Vc is assigned to each voxel to indicate both the direction and the magnitude of the flow at the center of the voxel. Many natural phenomena can be represented as fact fields, such as tornado, hurricane, and two swords. The next one is convolution neural network. A convolution neural network is a deep learning technique where it usually contains convolution max pooling and fully connected layers. Um, the purpose of convolution layers is to extract uh, useful features um, from the data, which is can better represent the data themselves. And uh, the purpose of max pooling is to downscale the input so that it can speed up, speed up the training and the inference. The third, the third one is fully connected layers. It can transfer global information to, it can transfer local information to global ones for the following tasks, for example, classification and the feature representation. So the motivation of this work consists of three parts. The first one is that in large scale scientific computing, the rate of data production is much higher uh, than the available IO bandwidth, which means that scientists may not be able to store data completely. The second one is that we need to preserve the insight of the simulation data with, with less storage in scientific data compression. The third one is that there are only few works on storing fact fields in a compressed manner. Therefore, to achieve the following goals, we suggest that we can, we can trace string lines and save them in the disk during simulation to represent the fact fields. This kind of representation has three advantages. The first one is sparse, which means compared with the original fact fields, the cost of saving string lines is very small. For example, if the original data may have 24 megabytes, um, so stored, uh, the saved string lines may only have 0 0.04 megabytes. The second one is that string lines can, be, can capture key features. Uh, third one is that string lines can, can be interpreted by humans. Um, instead of using direct um, binary uh, lo um, lossy compression, which compresses the original into binary files, uh, uh, we represent, uh, we store the string lines can still uh, help, help uh, scientists to understand the underlying fact fields because string lines because all the important information in the fact fields can be captured and stored in the string, line, string lines. Uh, to, to, um, to respond um, to reconstruct fact fields from the saved string lines, we propose a two-stage machine learning algorithm to reconstruct uh, underlying fact fields from the, the corresponding string lines. Uh, this approach contains two Two stages. The first stage is low resolution initialization. In this stage, we first randomly initialize a low resolution fact field um, based on Gaussian distribution, and uh, we update we update the velocities in the low resolution fact fields by computing the difference between the fact factors in the in low resolution and uh, the factors interpreted from string lines, and uh, and uh, we we apply backpropagation to est, um, to compute the errors and the gradient gradient so that this gradient can help us to update the velocities in low resolution in the low resolution one. And uh, once we iterative update uh, this low resolution factor field, we uh, finally we can obtain a high a good uh, a low resolution factor field with good quality. The second stage is high resolution refinement. In this stage, we design a convolution neural network to upscale the low resolution fact field to the original resolution. And uh, we update the parameters in the convolution neural network by computing the difference between the predicted 
flosses in the high resolution one and the flosses from the string S. We also use backpropagation to update uh, the parameters in convolution neural network. And in particular, we, in the design of the convolution neural network in high resolution refinement, we apply several deconvolution layers for upscaling. And after each deconvolution layer, we also follow a residual block to improve the performance. And in addition, this uh, applying residual blocks can also prevent gradient finishing in training in in training this uh, in training and this low resolution effect field to the high resolution ones. Uh, um, we found our approach based on the following aspects. Uh, Stage-wise comparison, representative streamlined selection evaluation, um, comparison with gradient effect flow, and a comparison with lossy compre compression. For stage-wise evaluation, we compare streamlined rendering results with and without uh, the high resolution re uh, refinement. Uh, this result shows that the string lines are not smooth enough in the region where no sample passes. Uh, if we only consider the first, uh, if we if we only consider the first stage, this is because if no string line passes certain factors, then the velocity of these factors are never updated during the first training process. Because uh, we because in the in the first stage we only update the velocities when we uh, when we can measure the difference between the velocity between the velocity in the lower in the lower resolution one and the velocity from the string lines. If if a certain pixel so that where there's where there's no string line pass, then it will never be updated in the first stage. Um, we um, as for the representative string line selection evaluation, we use the proposed proposed fact field reconstruction method. To evaluate the quality of selected string lines in representing the underlying fact field. Here we select 200 string line samples using three different methods PS, ISD, and IEP. We found that IEP achieves the best performance since the string lines selected by IEP are representative of the entire domain and they can therefore cover different parts of the domain equally well. In contrast, the string lines selected by PS and ISV mostly favors the parts where the flow field is complex. For example, the critical point in this data set, which leads to the difficulty in estimating factors in undersampled parts. Uh, for example, um, for PS and SV, we can see the difference uh, where we hide it with, the red uh, with yellow cycles. Um, as for the comparison of gradient effect flow, we compare future results in terms of string lines traced from the reconstruct effect fields and errors introduced by effect field reconstruction. For string line rendering, we can see that our results achieves a better reconstruct quality compared with gradient effect flow. Namely, it generates string lines that are closer to the input string lines. And as for the error images, we can see that the fact field reconstruction errors introduced by our methods are smaller than those introduced by GVF, especially in the boundary region. Here, we also compare quantitative results with gradient fact flow using four different fact field data sets. All these results indicate that our approach can achieve higher PSNR values compared with gradient effect flow. And we can see that if the effect field is more complex, we, the, we can, the improvement of the PSI is, much, is higher. For example, the super, the super current and the supernova data set. Finally, we also compare our approach with lossy compression. For, for, achieve, for achieving a fair comparison, we set a similar compression rate for both methods. Um, we we place five seeding points randomly uh, in the fact field, and uh, we highlight these five seeding points with green sphere spheres. 
and the results shows that the compared that the compared to our method, the string I traced from lost compression are less similar to the ground truth string lines. The reason um, is that direct compression of fact fields only controls the errors of fact field, not the resulting string lines. Moreover, small changes in the fact field during the direct compression and decompression process will lead to large difference in the in the tracing string lines. And to conclude, we propose a data reduction pipeline for static fact field data using deep learning techniques. We also achieve high quality reconstruction of fact fields from string lines compared with gradient fact flow and lossy compression. And this work is, is supported by US National Science Foundation and the US Department of Energy and the NVIDIA GPO grant program. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. All right, thank you so much for the talk. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll ask one of my own. I'm curious how you decided which alternative streamlined techniques to compare yours to. Um, actually, we um, used three different kind of streamlined selection approach to compare our approach. And we found that, uh, um, you know, different streamlined approach has different criteria to select streamlined. For example, PS and ISV could uh, lead to capture more interesting region in the whole fact field while representative will consider a domain coverage over the whole fact field. And we found that if you want to achieve a better quality um, for the fact field representation, we should consider the domain coverage. Gopal from because um, for example, for, ISV, for PS and ISV, it could be not capture too much students in the non interesting region, for example, in the boundary. So when we apply this, uh, our approach to from these streamlined samples, we don't have too much supervision about this boundary. So if you uh, go back to see the results, you can see uh, the results from um, PS and SV could lead to poor quality in the boundary. Okay, great. And if you think about the different types of techniques like yours and the others, are there particular applications in which you think your technique would stand out? Uh, yes, actually, our motivation is for compression because um, for scientific simulation, people will generate large, uh, large scale data, which, may also, um, which could lead to impossible to store in the disk for post uh, analysis. So here, our strategy is that just like a uh, compression method, you can compress the fact field and uh, decompress uh, after po uh, during post process. We can just uh, trace string lines and we only save the string lines. Uh, in the disk. So if you want to analyze the corresponding fact field, we can use our approach to recover the um, corresponding fact field from the sample string lines. And we can still achieve a very uh, a prop, a property um, compression rate compared with the other state of art compression algorithm. All right, well, fantastic. Um, last call for questions from the audience. If not, I think we will transition into our next talk. Thank you again. Thank you. All right. So next up is a talk entitled Analytic Provenance in Practice, the Role of Provenance in Real World Visualization and Data Analysis Environments. And the talk will be given by Karthik Madaganapal. I'm Karthik Manugopal from Texas A&M University. Today, I'm going to talk about analytic provenance in practice, the role of provenance in real-world visualization and data analysis environments. Practical data analysis scenarios involve more than just the interpretation of data through visual and algorithmic analysis. Many real-world analysis environments involve multiple types of experts and analysts working together to solve problems and make decisions, adding organizational and social requirements to the mix. The already complex process for data analysis are interwoven with further challenges relating to the need for verification, collaboration, and communication. It is no surprise, then, that many efforts in research and practice have focused on supporting the history 
or provenance or data analysis. In general, analytic provenance refers to the history of changes to data, system state, user interactions, and human understanding during analysis. Behavioral data captured during the analysis task could be used for various purposes such as externalizing analyst thought process, reproducibility of analysis workflows, recall analysis steps, and results. Dr. Reagan's et al. study has identified five different types of provenance, each of which has its own significant impact in one or more of the analytic tasks. The provenance types are data provenance, visualization provenance, interaction provenance, insight, and rational provenance. First of the three focuses on the data and visualization aspect, and the last two focuses on the cognitive aspect of analysis. Most of these provenance-based studies were mainly focused on understanding provenance from task perspective. That is, how provenance is useful for the tasks to be done effectively. The pre previous work has highlighted the complexity of many different perspectives and the purpose of provenance. But there remains a gap in understanding how the needs and purposes for provenance apply in real analysis environments. The goal of our study is to provide new knowledge about the role of provenance for practical problems in a variety of data analysis scenarios. Specifically, our study focuses on summarizing the needs and requirements for provenance support across different roles and domains, identifying the primary purposes and methods where provenance is currently captured and utilized. Also, identifying possible opportunities for advancements and new techniques for provenance support in analytic and visualization systems. In order to explore the needs and requirements of the data analyst and identify the area of concerns that are not entirely addressed with existing tools, we conducted semi-structured interviews with data analysts from different domains. Our study aimed to understand a holistic picture of the various tasks performed by analysts in their day-to-day -day operations and study how provenance data is currently used and could be better supported to improve job efficiency and quality. To understand analyst operations and intersections with provenance, we followed a process similar to theoretical sampling with multiple rounds of coding generated conclusions by analyzing the collected data using multiple rounds of data review. To make this a comprehensive study, we selected a diverse cross-sections of data analysts from various domains, age groups, and expert levels. There were a total of 14 participants, and the participants are primarily selected from three different domains, intelligence analysis, geospatial or imagery analysis, and cybersecurity analysis. The type of data and the characteristics of data analysis are different between these different domains. Our participants provided a breadth of information about analytic process and workplaces. One of the themes that emerged focused on various tasks that are performed by data analysts on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's take a look into some of the primary analysis tasks and challenges most relevant to workflow and provenance issues. Often, research considers that primary responsibility of a data analyst is to follow the analysis process and uncover the truth hidden in the data. But this is not the complete picture. Our interviews indicate there are various types of tasks that are performed by analysts apart from their core data analysis work. Apart from the core responsibility of performing data analysis, there exist other job responsibilities that a certain class of data analysts are expected to fulfill. For example, data analysts are responsible for collecting, organizing, and analyzing data from multiple sources. Whereas the senior data analyst's primary duty is to validate the results of other data analysts and create analytic products and reports. Some of the other roles that we have identified are data analysis managers, quality control analysts, and data analytic instructors or trainers. One of the key roles that were different from other studies is the quality control analyst. In our study, we found the quality control analysts are responsible for verifying the analysis reports that are generated by data analysts and making sure that the data and the results are valid and up to the standards. For each of the analytic tasks that were determined through the interviews, common challenges and issues were identified. After our coding analysis of interview results, we conducted a secondary round of data collections with the participants to better understand the relationships between analytic tasks and identified problems. 
This figure represents the final relevance mapping between analytic tasks and analyst problems. As you can see, the lack of analytic provenance data is identified as the most common issue across various analytic tasks. Apart from lack of analytic provenance data, other common issues identified are limited time, inefficient analyst training, limited human cognition, and lack of understanding of human process. We then summarized the core task areas related to the data analysis process and mapped it to the type of provenance that could help in addressing that issue. From these mappings, it is quite evident that capturing of insight provenance could help in handling majority of the analytic tasks identified through our interview. Let's take a detailed look into some of the analytic tasks identified through our interview. Source selection. Most analysts mentioned source selection as a critical task as a chosen source will inevitably influence the results of the analysis. While our participants were a mix of people who had worked on various types of analysts, source selection was a common across the board. Some of the participants who had less experience felt that senior analysts have an edge over them in terms of the quality of analysis, mainly because of the rich data profiles. From our participants, we found that current methods of understanding source selection strategies are done manually by conducting interviews with experts. We contend that capturing analytic provenance or interaction logs can be used to infer source selection strategies that are used by different analysts. Sense making. Through our interview, we realized there are various perspectives of sense making among the analysts. One of the analysts mentioned that sense making is a process of resolving contradictions that were identified in the data. In a nutshell, what our participants meant by sense making is the process of understanding the data and using the information derived to answer the analysis question. Training an analyst on how to think is a challenging task, as different analysts have different backgrounds and skills. Understanding the thought process of an analyst is imperative where training another analyst on how to perform the same task. Our participants felt that the current method of understanding sense-making model is shallow and does not provide additional information other than the models that are already in practice. Validation Analysts who have experience with validating analytic results mentioned, thinking about thinking is an important business and is often overlooked. A major percentage of our interviewees to find data analysis as a process of validating certain assumptions through evidence collection. A senior data analyst pointed out that the final results are not good enough to validate the analysis and the steps in which the analyst arrives at the results is very important and crucial to validation. It is important to make sure that the analyst has explored all areas of the data and that there is no flaws in their hypothesis and there is a lack of consistency in the level of provenance that is captured by analysts in today's toolkits. This lack of consistency is mainly caused by the human in the loop nature of provenance capture systems. If the provenance of analysis is not captured or presented in a standard way, it is very tedious to validate any analysis findings. Knowledge transfer. Most of the participants who are specifically intelligence analysts worked in shifts. In those environments, the same analyst tasks are shared by group of analysts who work at different times and in remote locations. At end of every shift, an analyst will have to share their results with their counterparts who will continue their analysis in the next shift. Analysts who worked in those kind of scenarios mentioned that every day they spent about an hour doing the briefing, which is very inefficient but necessary to do their collaborative work. Some of the participants mentioned that the knowledge transfer between the work shift is their primary problem and any solution that can help to improve will save time and increase their productivity. Quality control. Organizations that primarily focus on data analysis tasks will have quality control teams that are responsible for assuring the quality of file and analysis reports by making sure all the data points are verifiable, trustworthy, and the conclusions derived are plausible with high standards. Specificity, timeliness, accuracy, relevance, and clarity are some of the rubrics used to evaluate the quality of data analysis reports. Improved techniques could increase the quality and utility of annotations to enable the capture of provenance information that might not be automatically captured, such as analyst rational hypothesis and findings. 
Based on the analysis of previous literature, along with our findings from interviews, we have identified various opportunities for provenance support. Capturing activity log and inside provenance can address majority of the requirements we have identified through our interview. The interfaces for future visual analytic systems need to be designed with the provenance capturing requirements as a significant design focus. Management of provenance involves categorizing the types of provenance, identifying representation mechanisms, and building scalable storage and retrieval methods. Improved visual analytic support for provenance management would be beneficial for various data analysis tasks across numerous roles. Provenance data that are captured for analytic processes are often considered as state diagrams. When the volume of data that is captured for analytic provenance is moderate, it is easy to synthesize and derive useful insights from these different provenance visualizations. As the size of the graph grows big, it becomes increasingly difficult to understand the provenance graphs. New scalable visualization methods need to be developed to visualize analytic provenance in a simple and intuitive fashion. Training is one of the ways to improve the productivity of an analyst. Provenance captured during the analytic process when compared against process benchmarks could help understand where an analyst is performing well and where additional training is needed. Similar approaches may be developed but to derive curriculum requirements for new analysts. Using end-user behavioral data, we could also perform utility assessments of tools on a frequent basis. From our interview study that spans several areas of intelligence analysis and security communities, our research establishes a greater foundation of knowledge for practical problems in analysis efforts. It also highlights core issues involving the use of provenance in data analysis scenarios. Many issues are currently known by the research community and supported by existing tools and techniques, but significant challenges remain for many tasks. Furthermore, our study reveals opportunities for improvements across critical tasks having limited research and tool support. Thank you. All right, thank you, Karthik, for that really interesting talk. It looks like we have lots of questions already, so I'll start with a couple, and you might need to answer the rest in the Discord channel. Yeah. Uh, so Christian Bors asked, have you already tried to apply your findings in a practical project as well? It is, yeah. Uh, I work for a company called Knowledge Based Systems. We primarily build tools for intelligence analysts, and this has been a constant problem that they always want to solve real-world problems. You know, they, we always try to see, hey, data is a big problem. Let's try to build visualizations and algorithms to understand the data. But the problem is not just the data because there is enough algorithms available to solve that, but humans. Human is inevitable part of intelligence analysis. How can we solve that? And we did the apply most of these things. And the primary framework. root of this is to understand so that we can improve our tools. And provenance is one of the greatest feature. A lot of systems do capture provenance, but they don't use it in a way that helps the human to do their work or day-to-day -day operations in a better way. So I just want to coin one small example is one of the analysts said like, hey, you know, uh, in my process every day, they just call immediately and say like, hey, you have a quick task. You have to finish it in the next 15 minutes. This guy is already thinking through consciously about one of the data analysis problems. He has to stop everything, jump onto that, finish the task and come back to it. In that process, mm -hmm. no tools can help to get back, recall them, recall, recall what they did 15 minutes back. That human nature is still limited and no, not many tools are actually thinking that way. Okay, great. Um, one more question. Uh, did our participants mention any concerns or drawbacks about provenance at all? Uh, they did. Uh, one of the major thing is, uh, they say we are actually capturing provenance, but one group of people thought it's kind of, if you try to capture whatever we do, it's kind of getting into our privacy. We don't want that data to be captured. The second group of people say, hey, there is this, there's so much value for this, but I don't know how to use it. Do you have any tool? Do you have any suggestion? How do I take make use of these big logs? Because again, over time, when thousands of analysts work together, this is this becomes a big data problem.
there is no provenance summarization feature that helps people to visualize what is exactly happening in the provenance data. It could be analytic provenance, insight, interaction, it could be anything. But if you just look into one type of provenance itself, this is a bigger issue. But no one has tried to put all these types of provenance in one place and try to give a unified picture. That yeah. is another big issue. Yeah, absolutely concur. I and mean, that's certainly things that I've seen in my own work as well. So uh, you have lots more questions in Discord. I hope during the rest of the session, you'll have a chance to go look at those and respond. Um, but thank you. I think we need to move on to our next talk. Thanks, Melanie. All right, so next up is a provenance task abstraction framework. The talk will be given by Simon Atfield and both Simon and Christian are here to answer questions after the talk. A provenance task abstraction framework. In this paper, we propose a framework for addressing the problem of inferring usable task hierarchies from raw provenance information with a specific focus on visual analytics applications. In the talk, I present the general approach. Additional examples and a concluding research agenda can be found in the paper. Visual analytics supports exploration and reasoning over relatively large data sets using visual representations of data with an emphasis on enabling analytical reasoning. Visual analytics intentionally places the user in the loop of the analysis and there's been increasing interest recently in the idea of recording both data exploration and accompanied human reasoning referred to as insight provenance or analytic provenance as an opportunity for things like presenting interaction suggestions to the analyst, retrospectively auditing the quality and coverage of an, an analysis, tracing the origins of insight and assumptions, supporting collaboration between analysts, or simply providing an analyst with a record as a source of reflection and planning. Gotts and Zhu argue that scalable approaches to representing complex analyses are likely to involve the automated capture of low-level interaction histories and mapping these to higher level intents. In other words, task abstraction. We propose an approach to this problem. At the heart of task abstraction is the idea that low-level operations can be grouped into sets that can themselves be usefully considered as unified purposeful units of action. These units of action may then be grouped into still larger units and so on. Hence, any given coherent sequence of operations can be described in terms of an abstraction hierarchy in which higher level actions supervene over lower level actions. The idea of task embedding has a long history in ergonomics and HCI, with possibly the best known example as hierarchical task analysis. The idea is also central to the abstraction hierarchy in cognitive work analysis. Inferring provenance information carries a number of challenges. For example, Du et al argued that interaction alone can lack the context of visual representations for inferring underlying reasoning. And Andrienko et al argued that knowledge derived through annotation represents only a fraction of the intent of the user. They described the difficulties of externalizing the entire mental model and motivated the automated construction of such knowledge models. In our framework, higher level provenance is inferred from lower level actions. At the lowest level, level zero, is the original machine recorded archive of both user and software behavior. For example, a log file containing thousands or millions of events. A level above, level one, then groups such activities associating them with functions performed by the system. A still higher level, level two, could cluster these sequences into coherent actions from function calls. At this level, we may infer very basic user tasks such as drag and drop operations. The next level, level three, groups these basic user tasks into higher order user tasks such as a series of drag and drop operations to a higher level of abstraction such as editing a figure or diagram. 
the highest level in the provenance abstraction hierarchy, levels M to at level N, represent the user intent or goals. For example, the user is creating a figure or writing a report. At the heart of our proposed approach is an abstraction mapping mechanism which represents a conceptual encoding of task hierarchy, mapping low-level interaction sequences to intermediate user tasks, which in turn support higher-level goals. The abstraction mapping mechanism relates levels of abstraction in much the same way as a grammar does, and is, it's not itself a task hierarchy, although it can be used to construct one. We see it as a dynamic and involving structure. In the paper, we discuss the abstraction mapping mechanism in terms of three processes. Initialization, where mappings are learned or built. Parsing, where raw provenance data is interpreted. And leveraging, where the abstraction is utilized. Initializing. The first goal is to develop a process for inferring an abstraction mapping mechanism from low-level interaction data. As part of analyzing visualization system interactions, researchers may often manually annotate low-level provenance data with higher-level information about intents. This annotation process may be informed by extant models, used as coding framework, or analysis-specific and emergent issues. The abstraction mapping mechanism can also be inferred from interaction subsequences and other low-level patterns using machine learning. We argue that the initialization process can benefit from a synergy of top-down and bottom-up analysis of provenance data. An analysis process of this form requires both contextual input for known high-level task structures as well as a sufficiently large corpus of log data to support data-driven analysis. Two, parsing. The second stage involves a computational interpretation of logged provenance data into higher order task descriptions. There are a number of challenges to such interpretation. First, the meaning of any sequence of operations is an emergent property of the sequence. Low level operations only have determinate meaning to the extent that they are related to other low level operations. Sequences themselves depend on other sequences for their interpretation. Hence, interpretation is context bound. Interaction with visual analytics systems is also frequently opportunistic and exploratory and hence unpredictable. Users may do things for no apparent reason and with no apparent connection to any previous or future action. They may begin sequences that they don't finish or they may finish them sometime later after an interruption. Any interpretation would almost certainly be incomplete, consists of task stubs, and may vary in terms of the level of interpretation achieved. Partially matched tasks can cure complementary top-down strategy, driving the search for lower level tasks or operations that would complete them. We also anticipate complementary bottom-up and top-down processes operating at multiple levels of description concurrently with each suggesting higher level interpretations and each interpretation suggesting lower level events to be discovered. This is essentially a hermeneutic circle required in order to achieve a holistic and context sensitive analysis. Three, leveraging. The third stage centers around the means by which a user interacts with the abstraction mapping mechanism generated from the previous two stages. Starting with a top-down level of support intended for novice users, the system could generate a set of templates for how to complete the required task of the user. The user is then guided through those steps. Similarly, the abstraction mapping mechanism can support bottom-up processes building upon individual interactions. In this case, the system permits the user to begin interacting with the system and will provide suggestions for the next operation that will guide the user towards completing their task. 
Further, an analytical system can combine the knowledge of the user and the history of previous tasks to optimize the visual interface, attempting to maximize the efficiency of the user by hiding unnecessary functionality and focus their attention on the interactions that will enable them to reach their goal. The abstraction mapping mechanism could also be presented to system developers, permitting them to glimpse at how users are actually behaving with the system. If a developer can identify the pain points in their current implementation by seeing where users most often run into difficulty, they can work to resolve these issues in future versions of the system. We propose a number of approaches for continuous improvement. It's rare to be able to accurately infer a user's intent on the first try, and the same is true of provenance analysis. The process of constructing an abstraction mapping mechanism will need to be performed iteratively, where each iteration will involve revisiting all stages of the framework in both the top-down and bottom-up approach. We also argue that expressiveness is associated with the ability to consider context, variability and uncertainty. Accounting for context to disambiguate outcomes can be based on a number of factors, including but not limited to individual usage, environmental dependencies and the application analysis domain. Also, to maintain robustness of the task abstraction framework, the variability of a system, actors and domains should be represented in the abstraction mapping mechanism and during all stages of the framework. In the paper, we provide a use case of an activity analysis from the cycling domain. This illustrates the case of two levels of provenance with goals abstracted from the high level provenance data. We show how recommendations can guide an analysis by automatically segmenting data for suggested analysis with the adaptation of the task hierarchy, depending on user interaction. Our proposed conceptual task abstraction framework enables a meaningful mapping between raw provenance trails and high level descriptions of tasks. We note that our proposed framework is conceptual and has not yet been proven in practice. However, we illustrate application in an activity analysis scenario by showing how the task hierarchy and abstraction mapping mechanism are constructed based on a provenance generated from low level actions observed from a video inspection and derived high level tasks. We argue that the integration of context and variability allows for a more flexible and concise representation when parsing the task hierarchy. Iterative refinement will ensure unexpected interactions and provenance will be used for further optimizing the hierarchy. We further note that using high level tasks for recommending actions to users could be detrimental as many systems are available to users with variable levels of expertise expecting and accepting different levels of support. All right. Well, thank you so much for the really interesting talk. Uh, it's uh, really interesting theoretical work. I am waiting here for some questions to come in. Please post them in Discord or YouTube. In the meantime, I'm curious about applications of the work and um, kind of practicalities of implementing these things in practice. In particular, I'm curious if either of you have thoughts on the risks of Kind of having these suggestions or templates based on the past provenance data. What happens if the system misclassifies and gets it wrong? Doesn't understand what the user is actually trying to do and is making wrong suggestions. Shall I, shall I take that one, Christian? <clears throat> that's, um, that's always going to be a danger. And I guess what, um, what it might be important to do is to provide the user with the provenance of the, of the suggestion. 
So uh, the, the, in order to interpret whether the suggestion is meaningful or not, the user needs to understand perhaps how it's been inferred. Uh, and then maybe that keys into issues of transparency and artificial intelligence. If I, can, if I, if I understand the underlying reasoning of the system and uh, why uh, um, a suggestion has been made, I'm, I'm offered with the opportunity to, uh, to follow it or not follow it. But but I recognise the danger. It is a real danger. It's been a danger since Mr. Clippet uh, of, uh, <laughs> of of whether or not you follow her. But hopefully, I mean, I think the, the the real test is whether the suggestions prove useful. Because I think trust in AI systems is something as it with as with people is something which develops over time. So if the system's working well, then perhaps that can be overcome. Okay, and just building on that, Michael Carell asks. How well does the state-of-the-art event analysis work support the design goals required for the taxonomy? For instance, there was talk of needing ML methods to generate useful abstractions from log data. Is that a long-term goal or something that can be done today? I think that's, an, I think that's a, a, a medium-term goal. Uh, I think that the, the, the ability to identify repeating um, patterns or repeating strings, perhaps using hidden Markov methods or something like that, is a, is a realistic prospect. I think that the, the challenge lies in applying it to the domain of um, un interpreting provenance data, because in the talk, as we said, um, when people interact with um, visual analytics systems, they do so in various ways, which may or may, or may not be exploratory, chaotic. There'll be, there'll be um, stems which are incomplete. And, and for that reason, I think that, that the true test of the technique, uh, it, it relates to not just the inference of the mapping mechanism, but also the way the parsing works, that the parsing is flexible and is uh, resilient to um, low level interpretations that can't be res resolved into higher level interpretations and things that stop and change and uh, move, move into different areas. Okay, well, thank you very much. We are out of time, but um, check Discord for more questions and I think we'll move on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our next talk is entitled Capturing and Visualizing Provenance from Data Wrangling. And Christian is on this one as well. He'll be giving the talk. It's Christian Boss, and today I will give a talk about capturing and visualizing provenance from data wrangling an article which appeared in the CGNA special issue on provenance analysis for sense making. On behalf of my co-authors, Teresa Schwantner and Silvia Mitch from TO Wien, I want to thank you for your interest and welcome you to my talk. So before we dive in, I want to give a quick outline on what I will be talking about today. I first motivate why it's important to capture and visualize provenance for the sake of improving data quality. I will quickly give some background information on data quality and provenance research, and after a quick motivating example, I will describe our visual interactive approach called Data Quality Providence Explorer. And following up, I will give you some details about the evaluation we conducted, including the results of this evaluation. And in the conclusion, I will sum up the benefits and limitations of our approach and give some future directions. So as a start, people might not be intimately familiar with both of the two main terms I will talk about today. So let me give you a very quick description of both data wrangling and data provenance as we understand it. Data wrangling is often an iterative process of transforming data in order to prepare it for subsequent analysis and reading the data from quality problems or issues. Our second topic I will be talking about today is data provenance. In the field of computer science, it is a means of capturing the history of the data. It can be used to recall from where and sometimes also under what circumstances the data were derived. Usually, provenance graph will allow us to trace which actions were taken on a data set. We combine those two different methodologies of dealing with data to answer a simple but very important question. What has been done to a data set and can I use it for my analysis? Capturing provenance and storing the different states the data were in, we can, for, in for instance, judge their credibility. A user could look at the old version of a data set and juxtapose it with a new version of the same data to judge whether meaningful changes have been applied. The user can assess uh, data quality and judge if changes were necessary to improve quality, for instance, removing rows from the data. Uh, logging quality information as provenance could also allow us to see if problems that persisted in the data were already resolved, or if they still persist and need to be taken care of 
or accounted for in subsequent analysis. So these two examples were quite simple. What if there, there are a lot more ranking steps that are applied or the data we have to deal with is significantly larger in size or dimensionality? We can resort, for instance, to quantifiable measures of quality, for instance, data quality uh, metrics. These can be proportional measures of dirtiness, which puts the amount of erroneous values in relation to valid entries of the dataset. However, current approaches only give us this qualitative information for the current state of the dataset and do not allow us to store and compare this information to the previous state of the dataset. Hence, we're not able to see if previous versions of the data had the same problems associated with them. Also, there is a lack of visual means for showing the overview of data quality in a provenance context. So let's have a quick look at an example how data quality metrics can be used to give an overview of the data issues occurring in a dataset. Here we have a dataset showing mobile network connectivity tests. The data are rarely complete, but also show other anomalies like invalid network types or unreasonably high or low measurements. By employing three types of quality metrics, we are able to determine the proportion of different quality issues within the data. We can detect some type violations, invalid categorical data, numerical outliers or inconsistent values, and of course also incomplete or missing values. In this example, we highlight 30 entries using color to show us where and what types of issues were found. We leverage this technique in our data quality provenance explorer. We use the metrics to gain proportional information on the dirtiness of the data and the location of the issues, in our case, in which columns issues were found, and store them as provenance alongside the applied operations from data learning workflow. This will give, us you, uh, give users an idea of how quality has improved and developed during data learning. By storing quality information as provenance, we can help users to understand what changes have an impact on data quality. Data wrangling is rarely a linear process, and users frequently undo and redo operations or change their parameters. The linear se sequence we see on the left here is often only the la latest path the user has taken during data wrangling. Undo and redo operations cause forking and create new branches in the provenance graph. By logging all operations applied, including undo and redo steps, we re record a more comprehensive overview of what actions the user has taken during data running. Our data quality provenance explorer consists of two main components, the quality flow view and the provenance graph view. Let me first give you an introduction to the quality flow view. Very similar to our introductory example, we use color to convey the presence of quality issues in the data. We show stacked bar charts for every column that contains quality problems. If there are multiple types of problems, columns can occur at multiple uh, times. What we try to convey with this view is the proportional amount of errors in the dataset. The other thing we try to convey here is the decrease or increase in quality over time for each and every ranking operation. Each dark colored stacked bar corresponds to a sta state in the currently select branch of the provenance graph. With these flow-like transitions between states, we signal changes in quality between. So for instance, in the highlighted box, there was a decrease in quality issues for a particular column. This means that quality has improved as a result of this run ranking step. The second major component of is our provenance graph view. This view lets the user explore each state that data was in during the data ranking process. Icons show the type of operation that has been applied and edges connecting the different graph nodes also give the information if the data was filtered before an operation has been applied. The height of each graph node can vary depending on the size of the data for the current state. For example, in the top right, we see that there is a long sequence of operations applied, but also that there is a significant decrease in data size as a result of multiple row removal operations that were executed. A provenance graph view and the quality flow view are interactively linked. This means that while navigating the provenance graph, we can select branches to show how quality developed in the quality flow view. Upon selecting a node, the entire branch is aligned with the quality flow, allowing the user to see if an operation caused an increase in data quality. We also provide mouse over context information on the graph nodes, which represent the data states uh, in, on the graph's edges, which correspond to the rambling operations, and of course the quality flow, allowing us to see the amount of quality issues detected by our quality metrics and the change of quality caused by the operation. 
However, we are not able to make a qualitative comparison between the two varying outcomes in the provenance graph. To allow that, we also developed a comparison mode, allowing us to compare the quality flows of two separate branches. This way we can get an idea of how quality developed differently. The right side of the comparison view shows a mirrored quality flow of the second selected branch. If we look at both flows, they look quite different. This can be explained looking at the sequence of operations applied. The left one shows a branch where the operations changed at all columns at once uh, and were multiple row removal operations. Presumably, rows that contained errors were simply removed from a dataset. This caused a decrease of quality issues for multiple columns because some rows had quality issues in multiple columns. And on the right side, however, we see that only individual columns were affected by the operations. So we can assume that the right wrangling effort was more differentiated. This video example shows the comparison mode of two separate branches. In the blue branch, we see that the column removal operation causes a decrease in data quality because uh, perhaps entries without problems were removed and the overall ratio between correct and erroneous entries changed. What we can also see in the direct comparison is that even though the orange branch contains less issues in the provenance graph, we also see that the nodes are bigger, meaning that there is more data contained in these, um, more uh, entries contained in these data steps. Surrounded with these features, we aim to test if Data Quality Provenance Explorer is able to help users understand how data wrangling affected data qu uh, quality of a dataset. We wanted to evaluate if functionality helped users understand provenance recorded during wrangling. We developed a few hypotheses to validate our assumptions. We wanted to see whether users were able to use Data Quality Provenance Explorer to determine if and how quality changed in a dataset, and if it was usable for subsequent analysis tasks. But we also wanted to see if participants are able to compare branches to assess the difference in operations applied to the data and decide which of the branches poses the most useful data set for their analysis. Does the prototype allow users to derive which quality issues were inherent in the data set and how they were resolved? We conducted a user experience study with six participants that had varying degrees of experience in both data analysis, data quality analysis assessment, as well as visual data analysis. The study was conducted in a semi-structured interview style where participants were first introduced to the prototype, after which they were assigned a few tasks that were specifically tailored so that every component in the Data Quality Provenance Explorer had to be used. After the task assignment, the participants were interviewed to give feedback on how confident they were about their answers, what they liked about the prototype, and what their subjective opinion was on how well the task should be completed. All participants were, you, were able to solve the tasks they were given, which shows that uh, using Data Quality Provenance Explorer, users can judge quality and comprehend the development of quality throughout the provenance graph. However, with regards to the confidence of their uh, assessment, we saw a quite stark difference between people with limited experience in data ranking and people with more experience. People with more experience in data ranking had a lower confidence in the results, mainly due to the lack of being able to explore the raw data, which they found crucial to be uh, to judge whether data quality issues were resolved. What we could also observe during the task assignments was that participants pursued different methodologies for exploring the provenance graph, which implies that participants are able to use the Data Quality Provenance Explorer in a way that best suits their mental model for exploring data quality issues. What we could also find was that the prototype has a big reliance on the validity of the quality metrics. It is very important to carefully develop and adequately use the metrics, because if they do not work correctly, the results can easily mislead users to perceiving low or high quality of the dataset wrongly. So with these results, I want to conclude my talk. Today I presented to you Data Quality Provenance Explorer, an interactive approach for exploring provenance from data ranking. It features two main components, the quality flow view and the provenance graph view. By aligning the changes in data quality with the ranking operations, it empowers the user to assess the development of a data set and the associated data quality. The comparison mode is a means for visually comparing alternative branches in the provenance graph view. And in our evaluation, we could show that Data Quality Provenance Explorer is suitable for users to assess the development of quality over time. If you're interested in this prototype, it is publicly available on GitHub. It was developed as an extension to the open source data wrangling project OpenRefine, and the provenance graph is implemented on top of the open and provenance model. In future work, we aim to develop a more sophisticated and comprehensive set of quality metrics and also extend the functionality of the provenance graph view. 
So I want to thank you for your attention and we'll be glad to answer any of your questions. All right, thank you, Christian. You've already got several questions, so I'll launch right in. Michael Carell asks, have you considered affording custom quality metrics that might be complex or domain specific? I wonder if there's a metaphor like code asserts that could be generated to diagnose potentially harmful cleaning steps or broken assumptions that might be fatal for later analysis. So we addressed this kind of in uh, prior work that, that we did that was the basis uh, of, of this work um, of the Provence Explorer, uh, where we uh, allowed users to customize their data quality metrics. But of course, um, this is also, or this is always, it's always necessary to know, okay, what does the user uh, need the data for uh, and act accordingly to, to make those asserts and, and, and ensure that the user does not kind of destroy the data in the data mining process. So yeah, this um, obviously this is, uh, this might be automated in some kind of way or, or um, have some suggested suggestions for users, but yeah, we kind of did that already. <laughs> okay, yeah. great. And Maria Zemkova asks, if subsequent analysis reveals unexpected or contradictory results, can wrangling be analyzed in reverse to try again? Um, of course. So uh, since we have the entire provenance graph available to us and we see that there is an issue with uh, part of the data set, we could use um, either the, the, the quality flow view to search uh, for issues in the, in the, the columns or in, in parts of the data where um, problems were detected and act accordingly to, to navigate to a state where um, operations can be can be reversed and, and work from there on, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, there are several more questions for you, but I don't think we have time to get to them here. So <laughs> okay. please go into Discord and have a look at those and if we will sure. move on to our next talk. Thanks thank you very again. much, bye-bye. All right, so for our last talk, we're switching gears here away from provenance and it is something completely different. Next talk is entitled Towards Placental Surface Vasculature Exploration in Virtual Reality. And it will be given by Johannes Novotny. Hello, my name is Johannes Novotny. And today I will present our work on placental surface vascular exploration in virtual reality. This project was a collaboration between the computer science department of Brown University and the Rhode Island Hospital. Over the next few minutes, I will show how medical professionals can use MRI VR visualizations to identify blood vessels on the surface of the placenta without the need for prior vessel segmentation. But before going into the details, I will give you a short introduction to placental visualization in general. I will introduce the current challenges and how state-of-the-art visualization techniques attempt to tackle them. Then I will briefly touch upon the twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, which is a severe medical condition that can occur during twin pregnancies. It is the main research focus of our medical collaborators and a prime application of surface vascular exploration. After that, I will give details about the experiment we designed to evaluate whether virtual reality is an effective tool to facilitate this vasculature exploration. After discussing our collected results, I will finish up with our conclusions and the potential future directions for this line of research. The placenta is a temporary organ that develops during pregnancy. It facilitates the transport of oxygen and nutrient to the fetus and of metabolic waste products back to the mother through a complex vascular tree. As the main connection point, pathological problems of the placenta can have serious and sometimes fatal consequences for the fetus. Such pathological conditions can in some cases be spotted with medical imaging. Factors like size, location and structural anomalies can indicate the need for medical intervention. Now when it comes to measuring these placental features, 
we have to note that we are limited to certain medical imaging modalities. For the protection of the fetus, only non-ionizing methods such as ultrasound and MRI scans are taken. The difficult circumstances of imaging a live fetus often reduce image quality, for example due to motion of the fetus during the scan or due to lower data contrast in absence of a contrast agent. However, we can still use automatic segmentation methods to measure specific features of the placenta. A recent example for such a segmentation method would be work by Alan Sari et al. from 2016. They used a convolutional neural network to extract the 3D structure of the placenta without the need for user input. Going even further, Torrance Barena et al. used a combination of filters, support vector machines and region growing to segment parts of the internal vasculature of the placenta. However, this approach can currently only segment larger blood vessels, which limits its use in medical diagnostics. One case in which more detailed vessel information is needed would be the twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome, short TTTS. It occurs when the circulatory systems of twin fetuses get connected on the placenta. This often leads to one of the fetuses getting too much and the other one getting too little blood and can ultimately be fatal for both of them if left untreated. Depending on the stage of the pregnancy, it might be necessary to surgically sever the connected blood vessels. This is usually done using fetoscopic tools. In that procedure, the surgeon enters the womb with a thin endoscope, tracks down blood vessels through a narrow field of view, as shown to the left, and finally severs them with a laser. The lack of accurate vessel data means that the surgeon cannot make a plan for the procedure beforehand and needs to find all major connections during the procedure itself. Every connected vessel that is missed during such a procedure might in turn require another intervention, which further increases the risk for both fetuses. But to slowly come to our own contributions, the current clinical practice gave us several hints on what to do to improve the situation. The first thing to note is that surgeons track blood vessels on the surface of the placenta. Vessels there are not only visible through the fetoscope, they also protrude slightly from the placenta. We can take advantage of this feature in MRI scans, since there we can detect a very sharp boundary between tissue and the amniotic fluid. It is relatively easy to spot the large blood vessel that is passing through the highlighted area. This also indicates a second feature that we can use. The large blood vessels on the placenta all originate from the umbilical cord and branch out to the peripheral regions of the placenta. Tracing out blood vessels, just as it would be done during surgery, can give medical practitioners the basis to adequately plan procedures ahead of time. Now, instead of developing an algorithm that would trace the vessels on the surface and automatically generate some output, we decided to follow a visual approach. Our goal was to give practitioners better tools to visualize and analyze their placental data, but ultimately make the decision what is or isn't the vessel themselves based on their expertise. And what came to mind was of course immersive virtual reality. VR systems provide several key features that are very advantageous for our use case. First of all, its stereo view greatly enhances the depth perception of users in the system. And since our tracing task requires users to spot minute details on the surface of the placenta, we can definitely take advantage of the immersiveness of the system. The second point is the field of view. On regular desktop systems, you usually have the choice to zoom in on a region of interest, see it in detail, but lose the context to the rest of the dataset, or you zoom far out, see the entire dataset, but lose track of the detailed region. In VR, you can scale up the dataset to fill an entire room. You can get close to observe some features in detail, but you can still just uh, shift your head to see the rest of the dataset without having to move. This feature is enabled by the potentially 360-degree screen space 
and head tracking that is often present in virtual reality systems. And with all this background in place, we could finally ask whether medical experts could identify surface vasculature in an MRI VR visualization without vessel segmentation. We therefore designed an experiment to trace and identify all blood vessels within a given MRI dataset. And for this, we adapted an existing VR volume renderer with line drawing capabilities and used it to display our dataset highly scaled up in front of the participants. As participants, we recruited eight medical professionals from Rhode Island's Women and Infants Hospital to ensure that they all had adequate background knowledge about fetal MRI data. To provide a best case scenario for the VR environment, we used the Brown University Yurt Display Room as our host system. The Yurt is a high resolution cave system that can in some conditions reach retina resolution. It has a 360 degree horizontal field of regard and it of course offers the tracked stereo glasses and wand tools expected of such systems. The size of the yurt was large enough to allow participants to walk around the dataset completely. As dataset, we used an MRI scan of a fetus in its 25th week provided by our medical collaborators. To allow participants an unobstructed view onto the placental surface, we asked a radiologist to manually remove the fetus from the dataset. Since we were not able to obtain ground truth data for this particular placenta, we asked our collaborator, Dr. Lux, a leading expert in TTTS treatment, to trace the dataset for us. We then took his tracings and corrected it in the Slicer 3D application to match the surface exactly. The result of this reference tracing is seen to the left. Now I'm showing you a live recording of a participant completing the tracing task. You can see the red cone moving around. From the view of the participant, it is attached right to, its, to his wand tool. You can see that the participant is moving the dataset around and also moving his head to make full use of the parallax uh, provided in a stereo environment. This plot shows an aggregate of all collected tracings. Lines shown in green pass the reference tracing within a predefined margin of error, while lines in red indicate markings that are not found in the reference tracing. Overall, we get a pretty good coverage across all participants. On the participant level, we can see that the precision was overall very high, meaning that the majority of lines that were placed actually corresponded to vessels. Uh, we see a wider spread in the sensitivity, where several participants were too careful and did not actually identify a majority of the vessels. To give a concrete example, here are the participants with the lowest and the highest sensitivity results. We can see on the left that only a few of the reference tracings are marked, while the participant on the right hit almost all of them. In addition to that, participant 3 identified several artifacts from fetus removal as legitimate blood vessels. Participant feedback collected after the experiment indicated that the most difficult part was to accurately place lines in z-direction. To maintain a stable wand position during head movement, participants avoided to step from the left to the right side. We also noted that few of the participants used the wand to change the orientation and position of the dataset. Instead, most users navigated around the dataset using their own body movement, indicating that this might be a more intuitive movement modality. Overall, we consider our work a successful proof of concept that shows that virtual reality can enable the identification of surface vasculature without vessel segmentation. Participants reacted very positively to the much larger scale of the visualization that is possible in immersive VR. However, we recognized that the 3D line drawing tool we provided to the participants was not adequate. An interaction method that actively supported participants to draw lines directly on the surface would most likely have provided even better tracing results. This project also opened up new research directions. The first one is obviously to extend the proof of concept to actual TTTS MRI scans and validate that it can be used for surgical planning. In the same line, it could also be advanced to training and teaching applications as TTTS is a rare condition and more capable practitioners would be needed. 
On the other hand, we have been using the brown yurt as our base VR system. And since this is a very high resolution system, results from there are not necessarily applicable to HMD devices with lower resolution, such as the HTC Vive or Oculus Quest. Yet these devices would be the ones that uh, we would expect to enter medical practice. So validating the results on lower resolution devices would be another future research direction. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm open for questions. All right. Well, thank you for the really interesting talk. This is a really interesting application area of visualization. Um, while we're waiting for questions to come in on Discord, I wanted to ask one or two. I'm curious what thoughts you have on what you could do about that challenge of tracing lines in the Z direction. Like, what do you think are some potential directions we could explore to make that easier? Well, so one of the main things is there have been multiple techniques proposed to, instead of uh, just placing lines at the three point of the wand, three point of the wand, uh, instead giving the user kind of a ray tool uh, that acts like a laser pointer so that whatever point the user places is automatically placed directly on the surface. Mm -hmm. That also makes it easier for them maybe to just point and while they are completing the task, uh, step a little bit further away. It's something that we observed is that people try to keep their pointer on the surface, but it also limits the, their movement in a way uh, mm -hmm. by basically having to keep your hands stable while you try to look around and do kind of a parallax movement of your head. Right, I could see that being really hard. <laughs> I was also curious about the study task that you chose. In what ways do you see it as similar versus different from the, the surgical planning task that you ultimately want to support? So one thing is that we tried to mimic uh, uh, the tool use that the surgeons actually do by placing the user directly in front of the placenta. But at the same time, usually through the fetoscopic camera, the field of view is really narrow. So instead of that, uh, we provide them with uh, the entire placenta right in front of them. They just need to look. So um, that was actually received really well. I mean, the task itself was designed with a surgeon uh, basically helping us uh, set up the entire visualization. Uh, that's yeah, how we chose it. Okay, great. Well, thank you again. This concludes our CGNA session. I want to thank everyone for listening and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Blockchain has gained more attention and its applications are emerging. We collect 76 blockchain visualization tools and systematically classify them into five aspects. Target blockchain, blockchain data, target audience, task domain, and visualization type. 
In the end, we look at open challenge in blockchain visualization. Nowadays, data is often distributed and owned by different participants. There is an emerging need to provide a joint visualization, such as a TSNE projection, to serve as the full picture and data analysis. If the participants are privacy sensitive, how can we build a joint projection without data leakage? Conventional embedding algorithms, such as the TSNE, are designed for single site computation and require data centralization. Privacy leakage may H, up and in three stages in the visualization pipeline. We present a framework for the visual exploration of spine simulation data. We show the force distribution on spinal discs, enable assessments of imbalances and reveal impact vectors that were not accessible before. This is a novel direction in medical visualization and we hope that it might bridge the gap between biomechanical research and clinical application. Tableau helps you see the stories in your data. It's designed to help you be smarter so you can make better decisions faster. Connect to the data you care about. Sort, highlight, drill down, or filter your data in seconds. Add calculations to extend your data. With Tableau, you can keep on asking questions in the data until you discover the root cause. Tableau, answer questions at the speed of thought.
We propose data-driven space filling curves. Our new method generates linearizations that better preserve coherency than existing techniques. Our method supports 3D datasets and even multi-scale data on a quad tree or an arc tree. Many visualizations benefit from our method. For example, visualization of multivariate particles and visualization To interactively explore and visually analyze large multivariate data, for example, this cosmological simulation that is clustered into dark matter halos, we create a probabilistic data model in each cluster. We present a complete visual analysis system based on this data representation, which is especially well suited for the density-based visualizations shown here. Traditional flow visualization methods, such as line integral convolution, convey information about the underlying flow structure. However, the influence of regions in the flow on each other is not visualized. In my talk, I will present a new dense flow visualization technique, creating a multi-level hierarchy that provides insight into the region's connectivity using a probabilistic model. For more specific details, come here to Many techniques can be used to render and visually explore large 3D line sets with transparency. However, all these techniques differ in several aspects such as runtime performance, memory consumption, and image quality. In this work, we provide an extensive comparison study to discuss the advantages and drawbacks of transparency rendering techniques for large line datasets. We present an interface to visually analyze and steer zero-shot learning models. Our interface is designed to diagnose attribute mispredictions to convey potential failure modes in zero-shot learning. Using our interface, the user can select multiple categories for analysis. We allow the user to steer the model by changing the weights of potentially problematic attributes based on their analysis. Firstly, we extract contours of virions and distribution of spike proteins. From a newly estimated contour a 3D mesh with evaluated triangles is obtained. In the last step, rules describing relations between protein instances are defined by the user. The resulting model is created by application of all rules on the generated 3D mesh. Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well. I'm Heikyu Park from Georgia Tech. I'm very excited to present Bluff, a visualization tool to interactively decipher adversary attacks on deep neural networks. Deep learning is now commonly used in many domains. For example, in the medical field, deep learning models can estimate the treatment effects on patients. On the road, we can see self-driving cars using computer vision technologies. However, deep learning models are vulnerable to adversary attacks. An adversary attack applies carefully crafted perturbations on data inputs. 
and fools a model into making incorrect predictions. Adversary attacks jeopardize many deep learning based technologies, especially in security and safety critical applications, such as data driven healthcare and self driving cars. Due to the threats of the adversary attacks, people cannot confidently use deep learning models. To overcome the vulnerability of deep learning models, we need to understand how the adversary attacks permeate the model's internals. Also, for a better understanding about adversary 